of uh, the seminary years ago that uh, one of the great things that we all look back on is there's never been a scandal of someone running away with the money. <laughs> Mainly, there was no money to run away with, so we were safe. And, I, you know, when you lined me up for today, Bill, I just really want to thank you. Yes. December the 10th. We had no idea, did we, that I'd be driving through ice and storm and snows and all of this to get here. But, but we did it. We made it. Remind me never again to accept the 10th of December. <laughs> it's really been something, hasn't it? We, for the first, only second time in our 15-year history as a church did we cancel services. On Sunday morning, you know, uh, when you have preached as long as I have and every Sunday you're involved in, in preaching and ministering and then a Sunday comes and you don't have any services and you're home, nothing to do but watch football and <laughs> eat a late breakfast and you realize why people love staying home on Sunday morning. <laughs> That's what it's about. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, my wife and I had fun. It was great, but not supposed to look like that next Sunday, like we were grieved over the fact that we weren't able to. Anyway, they, let's do something really different we've never done together before. But today, I hope you will never forget uh, what we have done together. I hope you brought your sneakers, because we're going to take a long trip uh, together. But to do it, we'll have to step into the time tunnel with our imagination and go back over 200 years. Okay, let's select the year 1809. Okay, that's a good one. If uh, Diane Sawyer and uh, Tom Brokaw had been living back in uh, 1809, and if there had been television in that era, you can be sure of one thing, that they would be reporting on uh, the uh, battlefields in Austria that were experiencing one defeat after another as the uh, dictator of France was was moving through like a, like a f fire across the Kansas wheat field. One hamlet, one city after another is falling uh, as, as Austria is bowing before uh, this diminutive dictator who is uh, making his mark across uh, the world. In fact, the name... Uh, over all other names that would have been filling the news on uh, those evenings in 1809 would be the name Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, what's interesting is at the very same time, uh, of, of little concern to anybody except the people involved in them, tiny babies were being born in Great Britain as well as in the young colonies of America. But who cared? Because the news was all about Napoleon and uh, his sweep across Austria. I mean, he was by that time a household name from Trafalgar ultimately all the way to Waterloo. He was the news. But should he have been? When you stop and take... Uh, take the time to remember some babies born, you'll realize why I say that. Let's do a quick little survey, okay? We'll start in Liverpool, where the uh, Gladstone family welcomed uh, a little boy they named William into their family. And he ultimately would grow up and become well-educated and really take on statesmanlike qualities and we would become a prime minister uh, in, in the UK. You move over to Lincolnshire and in 1809, the Tennyson family welcomed into their home their fourth 
who was a, a little boy. They named Alfred. Little did they know when he would uh, grow up that he would become the poet laureate of, of the Isles. He would become the most prolific poet uh, in, in the last, 19th, uh, last part of the 19th century in England. And uh, as a matter of fact, Alfred Lord Tennyson, we know him today, would write at the age of 80 his most significant work called Crossing the Bar. As you move across the Atlantic, same year, 1809, while everybody's talking about Napoleon, you stop off at a, a Cambridge, a growing city, and there in Cambridge was a family named Holmes. And their little boy, who was born that year, they named Oliver. Oliver Wendell Holmes would grow to become a man of letters, uh, well-respected, statesmanlike qualities, and known ultimately for his, uh, his work in politics as well as a name he made for himself in literature. When you slip into Boston proper, same year, 1809, a hard scrabble family having difficulty even finding enough food to eat were not as thrilled to uh, have the birth in the home of a little boy they named Ed. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ed's family was so uh, uh, stricken with poverty and ill health that the mother died before the little boy was hardly able to walk. And out of the goodness of the heart of a friend named John Allen, he took Ed to himself and he reared him. And the only thing he uh, asked of him was that he take his name and he became his middle name. We know him today as Edgar Allan Poe, who uh, in a few years, only 40 years before his tragic death as a, as a drug addict, Edgar Allan Poe had become known as the short story writer and one of the most significant pens in all of American literature. Well, we're not through. Another family, a, a, a medical doctor whose name was, was uh, Robert, and his very young wife had their little boy, and he was the uh, delight of their lives. They named him uh, Charles Robert. And by the time he was an adult, they, they just had great hopes that he would be studying for ministry. And so... They uh, sent him over to Cambridge for his education and then up uh, into Scotland, Edinburgh for further education and ministry. But in many ways, he sort of broke their hearts as his interest moved in another direction. And by the time he was 50, he had published the well-known book that gave him a name around the world, The Origin of the Species by Charles Robert Darwin. But if we're going to stay in 1809, and who would in that day care about babies being born because it was all about Austria, Napoleon, or was it? You have to go down into the uh, forests of Kentucky, and you get to a little log cabin built by the owner who was a sort of a um, ne'er-do-well, as one biographer describes him. Uh, Thomas is his name. He married Nancy in 1806. They had a little girl named Sarah in 1807. And a couple of years later, uh, Thomas named his little boy after his grandfather, Abraham. Little did they know or would ever have thought that, that he would, at the young age of 51, 52, become our 16th president and in my opinion, the greatest we ever knew as a country, Abraham Lincoln. Now, isn't that amazing? All eyes were on Austria and all announcements made in the public media were about one person and one person only. And 
And yet today, only a few really eccentric history buffs could name one battle in Austria that Napoleon won. What we, they didn't realize then, in the world of politics and literature and art, was the genesis of an era, 1809. I give that story, that, that, that true sweep of uh, sort of a panoramic touch on life to sort of put things in perspective because we're not through with our travel. We're going to go back 18 centuries to another time when all eyes were on Rome it was as vast as it was vicious and victorious. And the name of that day was, of course, Augustus. He chose the name. Uh, and uh, he, he was, uh, to himself, the most significant uh, individual in, in, in all the world. And ruling over this... Uh, in incredible empire, uh, he had hardly known defeat in battle. And uh, because of the growth and because of the, the, the lavish lifestyle of those in leadership and those who enjoyed uh, wealth, there was a need to increase taxes. And so he sends out an edict that I'm sure he thought uh, was uh, absolutely uh, the single most significant thing he could have done to uh, bring in the taxes. And the result was that people had to go back to their place uh, of uh, natural birth. If it were to happen today, I would go back to Horton County down in South Texas because my place of birth was a little tiny town named El Campo between Houston and Corpus Christi. But for Joseph, his place of birth and his family's significance went back to the, to the little town, the little village of, of Bethlehem. Uh, and, and there he went with, with his wife almost at term, in her pregnancy. But who in all of Rome cared a, a bit about this unknown couple making that 90 mile journey from Nazareth where they lived down into to Bethlehem? I mean, Augustus is ruling the world. He's the one making the edict. But looking back, you realize he was simply an errand boy for the minor prophet named, named Micah. In fact, I often think of him as a, as a piece of lint on the scroll of a prophet. That's why I think of this great edict that, that he makes, thinking it's the most significant thing. Great, significant. Well, in, in a sense, it was what God used to bring the couple exactly to where uh, there would be the place prophesied hundreds of years before the fact, namely Bethlehem. Well, we're not true. We're going to come all the way back to where we are today. And here we are in the 21st century, and uh, we, we all read the news. We all watch it if we don't read it. And we're able to uh, name, we click off those things that are considered today to be significant. Uh, we, we got a president who is uh, decreasing in popularity in the eyes of the very nation he's supposed to be leading. We have a, we have a death in South Africa of a man that we all admired from a distance that's got everybody's attention in the news. We have a we, we have a country that's enriching uranium, and there's the, the struggle over whether the agreement that's being made is a safe one. We have a man who is 
uh, standing, thank goodness, for the great nation of, of Israel. As Netanyahu announces his disagreement with these terms that are being drawn up regarding Iran. And, and, and on and on it goes. We have, if we, you, it'll be significant for you, we have the school. We have the seminary. You're doing your work and you're, you're, you're studying. You've got your exams coming in a matter of days. And a semester will be over and another semester will begin. And in the first month of next year, you'll be on your way for further work toward your goal of your future. And all of a sudden, the, the, the brakes go on, and uh, what we call today Christmas comes. And, and, and in this brief period of time, we pause and we pick up a little, hopefully, a little perspective. Where it really is about a little baby. Think of it. Not, not just any baby. Not even a baby that we would call as significant as those we've named earlier, but the God-man who came. I've always liked the way Eugene Peterson writes of his incarnation. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Isn't that good? Neighbors didn't want him. They hated him. Oh, there were a few that respected him and, and came to realize his value, but for the most part, not only his own, not even his own people wanted him. Came, as John writes, came unto his own things and his own ones didn't welcome him. They didn't want him. In fact, when he opened the scroll in his own hometown where he'd grown up all those years, they quickly asked, who does he think he is? Who is he to tell us? Especially when he reads from that section of the, the, the writings in Scripture and, and, and claims that he is there. He, he is the one. And how they resented that. When in fact he was clearly the one who should have been heard. And should have been adored. Should have been loved. I can guarantee you without being a prophet or even the son of a prophet that from here till the, the day we celebrate the birth, you will not hear over the evening news in any significant sense information about the little baby that was born. You will not ever hear over any of them, any of the channels on television of him as the God-man wouldn't be politically correct. You will not hear of the role that he was to fill and the place he took in the flow of history. I know this is a different kind of message, but it's one today I don't want you to forget. It isn't about a journey to 1809 or even further back. It is about the perspective between what seems at the time insignificant is in fact very significant and what seems at the time terribly significant is, it, it is hardly worth a further thought. Battles come and go and admittedly they are significant at the time. Events in history are shaped and reshaped Presidents are elected and then re-elected and then they move along as another one comes on. Campaigns as one after another runs for an office locally and then nationally. And, and, and if we're not careful, 
if we're not careful. The season will be about bright lights and pretty trees and malls and big gifts and who gets and gives what. And we won't take the time to come back to the person who moved into the neighborhood. We'll also forget the attitude he represented when he came. Who, though in the form of God, thought it not something to be grasped, to be seized, his remaining equal with God, but took upon himself the form of a of a bond slave and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he became obedient to death and the definite article is out of the picture as Paul writes of it in Philippians 2 even a cross kind of death even death on a cross but it isn't over there God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Don't ever forget that. I, I, I know you won't. You're in the study that will mark you for the rest of your life. Don't ever fail to preach it. Always remember in your message along the way, from one message to another, always include the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Always remember there will be someone who never, ever has heard that name. We were traveling in Turkey, literally, uh, several years ago, and, and uh, we had... Uh, finished our tour of uh, Ephesus, and we were on our way back uh, on one of our Insight for Living uh, uh, cruises, and we, we, we stopped at the rug factory. The reason? I have a wife who loves those beautiful rugs, and I always say before we go in, we're going to enjoy looking at them. <laughs> they are beautiful, aren't they? She gets real quiet because she has other things that she, and she also uh, has women with her, so they team up on me. And uh, so I wind up sitting out on the porch while they're in there looking at all the rugs. And um, to my surprise, the owner of the shop is uh, walking toward me. I don't know who he is. He introduces himself in broken English and uh, I thanked him for speaking English. I said, your English is a whole lot better than my Turkish. So I can tell you, uh, we can communicate better. And he said, you're, uh, you're with this group? I said, yep, I am. He said, a big, big group. I said, yeah, it is. He said, uh, you, uh, you come to our country often? I said, well, maybe, maybe every three or four years we're here. And we always enjoy it. And my wife, he says, I like that. That they're in there doing uh, what they're doing. And I said, well, uh, thanks. Um, <laughs> he said, uh, what is the group? I knew this was going to happen, and I want to be very careful how I said this. I said, uh, well, we're, um, we're, a, uh, we're a group that, that uh, follows uh, a man, a person. Oh, really? Yes, uh, his name is Jesus. He leaned forward and never heard the name, and he said, Jesus. I said, yeah. He said, is he here? <laughs> Isn't that a great question? Of course it is a great question. And I said, actually, in some ways, we like to think he's here. And I didn't want to get too ethereal on him and, you know, and <laughs> dump the whole truck in a moment, I said, actually, he's, he's not here physically, no. But let me tell you what we believe about him. He sat down right by me uh, as, as if he were a little six, seven-year-old boy. 
And he, he listened to me because it was all brand new. What a privilege to talk about the little baby that was born who grew up in the Middle East and, and became the savior of the world. And he, he knew nothing of the cross, knew nothing of the crucifixion, knew nothing of the story. Here was a grown man running a multi-million dollar business, a, a man who is involved internationally in shipping and all of this stuff, who has a large number of people working for him in shops all over the country. Never once in his life heard the name of Jesus. And as we talked, uh, he said, I'm Muslim. I said, I, I know. That's fine. But you need to know that there is really one God. And one, I didn't know how to do mediator, you know. So I said, one bridge, one go-between, between this one God and, and us. And it's Christ Jesus. <gasps> he had never heard that in his life. I uh, spent a few more minutes with him. Some one of his guys called him, and, and he left. And I just prayed, Lord, now that now that we've uh, sort of left that information with him, I pray you'll use it. Maybe someone else in our group will take it from there. Isn't it amazing? I would have never thought we would meet. I, and if we met, I would have never thought this grown man, probably in his 60s, would have never once heard the story or heard about the man. And you know what? It's true of most of the people on this earth. Don't forget that. When you're engaged in what you'll be doing, whatever it may be, whatever realm of ministry, keep helping, keep the message out there so that people grasp the significance because they're all caught up in what, what makes the news or what they're going to get for their aunt because their aunt got them this nice thing. They got to go back down to the mall and get her something. And all that nonsense. I'm, I'm not Scrooge. I'm, I'm not against it. You know, I, I think it's, I think all that's fine. But the longer I live, uh, the more I'm seeing the insignificant in the eyes of the general public is really the significant. And I'm not the, I'm not the only one that does that. Uh, years ago, a pastor uh, from Great Britain put it in in, in, a, in a beautiful way, and some of you have heard how he did it. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village. He worked in a carpenter shop until he was about 30, and then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. Never wrote a book, never owned a home, never had a family. Never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. Never did one of the things that usually accompanies greatness. The tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. Another betrayed him. Taken under arrest. Nailed to a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth while he was dying, and that was his cloak. When he was taken down, he was put in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen, twenty wide centuries have come and gone. Today, he's the centerpiece of the human race. He is the leader in the column of progress. I'm far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. 
He's the one we adore. I'm grateful that the Lord uh, puts the brakes on our lives. And whatever we may call the season, doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it is a reminder to me to do what I tell the folks on our tour to do. To walk a little slower. To think a little deeper. To talk a little less. To listen a little better. By the way, I've learned that I never learn anything while I'm talking. I learn when someone else talks. And at this time of the year, it's wonderful how the Lord has things to say to us. That you're not going to get from your studies. You're not going to get from academia. You're going to get from time with him. So if you've got a family, be sure that you deliberately teach those little ones the importance of being still for just a little bit of time and remembering that he is God. I love the way G. Campbell Morgan put it. He was the God-man, not God indwelling a man. Of such there have been many. Not a man deified. Of such there have been none, save in the myths of pagan systems of thought, but God and man. Combining in one personality the two natures, a perpetual enigma and mystery baffling the possibility of explanation. Think of it. Undiminished deity, true humanity, one person, unmixed forever. Forever. Right now, the only member of the Godhead in bodily form right now ready to come for us just when the Father says it's time. How, how, how great it is that we keep this perspective. And I know I speak to you who are becoming so well educated in the, the truths of the scriptures. But if you're not careful, you'll make that the significant part of this part, time of the year rather than the one who is. Finally, I was reading again uh, the Jesus I Never Knew, which you really need to read by Philip Yancey. The Jesus I Never Knew. He does a marvelous job of acquainting uh, the reader with those parts of the story that you would miss. And some of it, you'd be as blank as my friend there at the, at the rug shop outside Ephesus. When you think of it in these ways, listen to his uh, analogy and then we'll pray. I learned about the incarnation when I kept a saltwater aquarium. Management of a marine aquarium, I discovered, is no easy task. I had to run a portable chemical laboratory to monitor the nitrate levels and the ammonia content. I pumped in vitamins and antibiotics and sulfur drugs and enough enzymes to make a rock grow. <laughs> I filtered the water through glass fibers and charcoal and exposed it to ultraviolet light. You would think, you would think in view of all the energy expended on their behalf that my fish would at least be grateful. <laughs> Not so. Every time my shadow loomed above the tank, they dove for cover into the nearest shell. They showed me one emotion only, fear. Although I opened the lid and dropped in food on a regular schedule, three times a day they responded to each visit as a sure sign of my designs to torture them. I could not convince them of my true concern. To my fish, I was deity. I was too large for them. My actions too incomprehensible. My acts of mercy they saw as cruelty. My attempts at healing they viewed as destruction. To change their perceptions, I began to see would require a form of incarnation. I would have to become a fish. 
I would have to speak to them in a language they could understand. A human being becoming a fish is nothing compared to God becoming a baby. I love that line. And yet, according to the Gospels, that is what happened at Bethlehem. The God who created matter took shape within it. As an artist might become a spot on a painting or a playwright, a character within his own play. God wrote a story only using real characters on the pages of real history. (laughs) As the word became flesh. I'll I'll never get over the marvel of it. I hope I never do. Father, in this uh, quiet place, now familiar to us, and sitting with those we are getting to know better from day to day, walking from class to class and going from course to course, as one year passes into another, I think of these faculty members, these fine men and women, and I pray for them today. I pray that you will keep their hearts soft and warm to the truth of the gospel. I pray that it will never become ultra-familiar, but it will become a place of new discovery and fresh realization of what you have done for us. And I pray for these students that you will give them hearts that are as open as that dear man in Turkey several years ago. May their mouths still drop open. May they on occasion suck in their breath when they realize what it is that they are discovering and what this truth can mean to those who have never heard it or those who have grown weary of it. Thank you for the season. Thank you for the beauty of simplicity. Thank you for the one we will and have for years adored, even Jesus. We come today to adore him. In his blessed name we pray. Everybody said.